Good morning. I'm Leanne McGowan, the Director of Business Development at RideWise. And thank you for taking part in October's EV Coalition program, which is a special joint webinar with the NJAPZA. It's great to be working together on our EV and infrastructure goals. And collaboration is the key for us all making progress toward New Jersey's ambitious goals. I wanna welcome those of you who've been joining us over the past 11 months or so for 10 programs we've offered, and many of you who are here with us for the first time. And the last time I checked, we had over 55 municipalities represented from all around the state, which is wonderful. For anyone not familiar with RideWise, we are the transportation advocacy organization serving Somerset County. And if Sarah Catherine would just advance our slides. RideWise is a TMA, and that's a Transportation Management Association. And we um, encourage everyone to check out ridewise.org for more information. And if you are interested in learning about the TMA serving your area of the state, uh, you can look that up online. You can certainly email me, Leanne, L-E-A-N-N-E, -N -N -E, at ridewise.org. And due to the large size of our group today, we are in webinar mode. We will be back to a more interactive meeting format next time. We can go to the next slide, please. And we're going to share today's recording by email and at ridewise.org slash let's go electric under EV resources. And at the end of the presentation, our panelists would be happy to take your questions. To ask a question, please use the Q&A feature. And for any tech issues, please send a private chat to Sarah Catherine Lichen, our webinar host and RideWise Communications and Outreach Coordinator. So just take a quick look at these goals. These are three of the county's six goals that RideWise is assisting with. Next slide, please. Just gonna give a few updates. This is actually our agenda for today, just to get a sense of timing. We hope you'll be able to stay with us past the hour if Q&A goes over. And next slide, please. I always try to give a few updates. Um, anyone who's attended our programs before has received this information via email about the NJ Zip expansion. This is a voucher pilot program that helps businesses, municipalities, nonprofits, and schools offset the cost of purchasing new zero emission medium duty vehicles. And vouchers range from 25,000 to 100,000 and they're available on a first come first serve basis. And so now in addition to the greater Newark and Camden areas, they've opened it up to the greater New Brunswick area, which includes many municipalities on this Zoom today. And if you need more information, please go to njeda.com or again, feel free to email me. And bullet two, I'm sure many of you know that we recently lost the charge up incentive but it will be back in 2022. So stay tuned. Uh, for bullet three, I was recently asked how New Jersey is doing um, compared to other states, how we're doing with EVs. And so I just wanted to take uh, a quick minute to look at the big picture of where we are now and imagine where we can be, um, the progress we can make um, with the new model EV ordinance and other initiatives and incentives. So next slide, please. And this just gives you a quick look of where we are. And you can see New Jersey highlighted. So sometimes we're a little surprised to see um, New Jersey is not maybe at the top or a little farther along. Um, but I think we're, we're going, we're gonna see a lot of movement here with the new model ordinance. Um, I'm going to put the, uh, the link to this information in the chat. Um, and then I'm sharing this quickly, but you can see more of the full article. And then the next slide shows how New Jersey ranks as far as EV and infrastructure adoption rates. And our overall ranking is a little lowered by factors like availability to char of charging and the in charging infrastructure. So we know we've got work to do. 
but the model ordinance will help our work to increase adoption and infrastructure and establish New Jersey as an EV, as a top EV friendly state. The model ordinance is intended to enable EV adoption for people who can't charge at home and give consumers confidence to drive electric without range anxiety by increasing the proximity of charging infrastructure. So you're in the right place to learn more about the model ordinance and how to implement it. And I'm excited to introduce our three main presenters. Next slide, please from the New Jersey Association of Planning and Zoning Administrators, a professional organization for land use professionals throughout New Jersey. NJAPZA provides educational and networking opportunities and works to support the professional development and career advancement of its membership. We're very happy to have Christina Schwartz, Executive Director, and David Coys, President, and Clifford Givens, the Attorney General Counsel for NJAPZA. And um, you can see here, they all have broad experience in these areas. And I wanna thank you, Christina, David, and Clifford for the work you do, for sharing your expertise with us, and for all the time you've put into today's presentation to benefit all of us. So feel free to start and thank you. All right, great. Can everyone see the presentation up here? Uh, good morning. I'm Christina Schwartz. I'm the Executive Director of New Jersey Association of Planning and Zoning Administrators uh, and also a municipal official, the Zoning Officer of Reddington Township, Hunterdon County. Uh, we're so excited to have so many of you with us today, uh, so many municipalities represented from around the state, uh, and also uh, this opportunity to partner with, with RideWise. They have some really great resources and very interesting information. And when this opportunity came about, we wanted to see, well, where does uh, NJA PZA fit into this and what kind of information can we you know, offer to this process with the model ordinance? Um, as many of you know, David, Clifford, and I are very involved in the NJA PZA, myself as the executive director, David as the president, and uh, Clifford as our general counsel for many years. Uh, so we are all uh, very passionate about what happens at the municipal level, supporting the land use professionals that are now you know, tasked with this, this new model ordinance. Um, and we really want to focus today's session on helping you implement that you know, in your municipalities and what that means for you. Uh, so you know, Leanne gave us a nice introduction here. Uh, just want to stress that you know, the three of us presenting here today, you know, are in the trenches in those front lines, either enforcing this ordinance, having to understand it for ourselves and our municipalities, or in a role as a, a professional like Clifford, advising those municipal officials um, and also helping those municipalities. David or Cliff, anything else to add here? Oh, it's a pleasure to be in, it's a pleasure to be presenting today and uh, thank you for asking us to join you. And, uh, and also I am a actually a ride rise uh, board member so I'm the Hillsborough Township uh, representative and have been serving on that board for for several years and um, I'm also part of the EV coalition a big part of the effort that ride rise has been doing and um, really trying to get the information out there to the public to try to help move things along. I also have a little bit of a unique position in having a, a number of responsibilities working for Hillsborough, where I'm also the sustainability director. So I'm also working on policy, uh, education, and outreach to try to help move things along from a policy standpoint in, in the town. So not just regulatory in terms of uh, working with the planning and zoning department, and um, serving my role as a deputy zoning officer for them, but also in working on trying to advance uh, some of these initiatives. All right, thank you. So let's get into today's objectives for the session. Uh, we have a few different sections of our presentation and also some key objectives. Uh, we wanna to start today uh, well, first, we have a poll here to try to identify, you know, 
who's with us today? Who's listening to this? Um, who is uh, on the session? So if you would take a moment to answer that. Um, so we're gonna start today with a brief overview of the statewide model EV ordinance. Uh, there's a lot of great resources out there. Uh, there's some other sessions I looked into when I was preparing for this today that really give some great background um, on the legislation and also you know, the development of this model ordinance. Uh, so we're just gonna go over that briefly to create a framework um, to be able to talk about implementing this at the municipal level. Uh, then we're gonna highlight the importance of the awareness and training of local officials of this model ordinance so you can more effectively implement that in your township. Uh, we're gonna follow that by going over some procedures and actions needed to implement this ordinance. And that's where uh, David today is gonna get into some of the nuts and bolts of the ordinance, uh, some of the requirements there, some interesting points you wanna be aware of. And uh, Clifford is also gonna speak in that section about some um, of the legal responsibilities of a municipality and also some cautions to municipal officials specifically when reviewing these applications and um, working on your processes internally. Uh, we're gonna finish up with providing some strategies to successfully implement your EV reviews uh, and also you know, disseminating information to the public on this. So let's get into our next slide here and uh, David's gonna go a little bit into you know, how did we get here? Thank you, Christina. So how did we get here? So we have this, um, as Christina said, we have this draft ordinance that we're really going to go into and really focus on uh, a lot of you who are on this webinar as, as the regulators, as the people that are going to be responsible for getting these requests, these <laughs> applications. And uh, so we're really going to get into that. But how did we get here? So a couple of really big things happened in 2019. The New Jersey Master Plan was, uh, Energy Master Plan was adopted. And some of the big takeaways from that, 100% clean energy by 2050 is one of the big goals for the state. Um, also, what ended up happening is New Jersey did something a little bit unique in that it wasn't just they adopted a master plan, but they actually also adopted legislation that put elements of that into law. And some of that are, are part of the goals. So the New Jersey EV law, which was adopted the same year, and some of the really big things that that did was focusing on, on trying to have goals on how many EVs, uh, electric vehicles getting on the road. And one metric wanted to share, there's a number of other metrics. So uh, if anyone is interested, you certainly can go to the state website and they have really great great information. And when we start to get some information out there to everyone as a follow-up, we'll be sure to include links and like that. So you could go to some of these documents and look at some of the great resources that are out there. But one of the, one of the first major goals is over 330,000 plug-in EVs by 2025. Uh, another part of the law was a big emphasis on the increasing of the charger uh, charging infrastructure. And you could see all these numbers here. I mean, it's, it's very ambitious. It's, uh, it's very doable, it's definitely achievable, but it was very, very ambitious. Now, part of that, um, part of the energy master plan was actually tasking DEP and DCA to actually start working on a draft model ordinance, e even back then. And uh, they started meeting with different, um, with, with different groups, different stakeholders. And in 2020, uh, the, D the DEP actually contacted us, NJAPZA, and started to ask us for, for some feedback. And uh, at that point, they had uh, early versions of the ordinance. And what we as an organization was able to represent to them was a really big emphasis that, um, you know, any of the zoning officials that were making decisions uh, based on their ordinances, and as everyone knows on here, for the most part, a lot of people know 565 towns, 565 zoning ordinances. This is new technology, and a lot of our ordinances do, are not ready to be able to, do, to know how to deal with it. So we really emphasize to the state that our zoning officials are making the right decision when sometimes 
If there's not enough information, they might have to um, potentially deny it, uh, send it to a board. Uh, unfortunately, even though a lot of these wonderful goals were adopted, uh, there was a number of tools that were not given to the regulators for us to be able to, to know what to do with these requests. Because what started happening is the electric vehicle charging companies went back to the state and said, hey, we're getting caught up in all this regulatory uh, red, red tape. And, and they were. And, and rightfully they were because the zoning officials were making a lot of times the, the right call if the ordinance didn't have any of this verbiage or anything like that. And they were really, as a lot of us are trained, uh, when in doubt, deny. Um, and we really needed a good foundation. So we really emphasized to the DEP that it was really important that, um, that the state uh, explore the MLUL, perhaps uh, make this uh, by right, uh, give a lot of guidance in terms of uh, zoning official, how we would make the decision and to really try to give the regulators the, the right tools to be able to make these decisions. And, and if there was a way to avoid having each and every town have to adopt their own, uh, to perhaps take the lead and really go through the MLUL. So we're very pleased where we saw a number of things that they did decide to implement, but just wanted to get, share that, that background is that we did get to have communication. And today we have a direct line of communication to the, to the DCA. And for everyone that has questions today, and again, no legislation is ever perfect. And as it's going to be a lot of our responsibilities to administer this, you're going to have questions. You're going to get frustrated. Uh, please reach out to us, NJAPZA, and we're more than happy to talk to DCA and uh, to have like a good line of communication uh, as they're going to be um, really trying to make improvements to it if, if necessary. I just like to add that uh, also for, you know, those officials who are here, I don't know if there are any attorneys in the uh, municipal attorneys in the audience, but remember too, that an important source of information for you in terms of implementing this uh, model ordinance and dealing with these issues is your municipal attorney or your board attorney, depending on who exactly is impacted. Uh, I strongly recommend that you coordinate with he or she, uh, we're all kind of, you know, getting up to speed on this. I know that I'm chairman of the Municipal Land Use Law Drafting Committee for the League of Municipalities. And, you know, this is an issue that we're dealing with. And many, many of my colleagues are dealing with it. We're, we're you know, we're, we're getting prepared to help you. So you should not hesitate to uh, avail yourself of our, uh, of our work. Uh, and our help. Uh, it's not a good idea. I, you know, I, I know that in some circumstances this may not, I mean, we'll, we'll touch on this as we go forward, but uh, I just thought I, I should mention that, uh, you know, we're all kind of working together on this right now. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's new to all, um, and we thought it important to highlight, well, why a mile ordinance? Why did they come up with this uh, you know, model uh, code for all of us to implement? And obviously the main driver here relates to the clean energy goals of the state, um, but what can be achieved by using a model ordinance that all municipalities are required to adopt? So for us in the land use offices, the main goals here are consistency and compliance. So this model ordinance ensures that municipalities are requiring the installation of this electric vehicle service equipment and these make ready spaces in a consistent manner. Uh, as David said previously, you know, typically with ordinances, yeah, you're gonna find all these inconsistencies or changes between towns. They wanted this to be something where uh, anyone applying or even in the townships it's gonna be very consistent across the board. There's not gonna be a learning curve to apply, you know, for your EV charging spaces on this job versus the other. Um, it's going to be, you know, a very streamlined process. Uh, that is also helpful as land use officials. You can reach out to your other colleagues in the field, get some feedback on, you know, how they're handling things, uh, work with our organization, um, you know, and those other resources, and you can really, 
rely upon that you're all supposed to be enforcing this in a very similar way. Uh, compliance was another major guideline here. Uh, with providing a model ordinance that most towns can adopt with little or no, uh, changes, you know, it really uh, urged towns to act quickly and begin to start using this right away. Um, uh, next slide here, David. All right, and lastly, uh, and this speaks more to the state's goal of increasing you know, the, the clean energy goals, the number of EV drivers. Uh, getting this implemented can really help assist uh, with those that cannot charge at home. Uh, most people having electric vehicles maybe do not have a port inside their garage. Uh, so this will help them you know, go around town and things. And also with what is called uh, range anxiety. And with some of the resources available at RideWise and some of these other outlets, there's some very you know, interesting information around these topics um, that I found interesting you know, in, in getting ready for today's session. Of, you, know, you, you, you might have your plan for your daily errands and things, but you're afraid to go drive and, and see that friend you know, that is a few hours away from you or in the next town over because you're unsure of your plan you know, to charge your car there. Um, and while we were going through this internally, you know, uh, Clifford had some interesting uh, takes on why implementing a model ordinance, you know, was so significant here. And Cliff, if you want to speak to some of that on why this is so impactful. Sure. Um, New Jersey, as you know, is uh, unique. Well, I, I, I uh, a former attorney general has uh, often said to me, if anything has happened in the field of land use or environmental issues, New Jersey has tended to face it first, or maybe California otherwise. Uh, but we, we have confronted it, and most of us, uh, uh, we, we may have interpretive decisions, we may have uh, rulemaking, jousting, and things like this. In, a, in certain situations, the state and its and its agencies, such as the Department of Community Affairs, have promulgated regulations or made uh, set up a framework for adoption by municipalities of the regulations that are involved. Because uh, while some while some towns are equipped to draft their own ordinances through their either their attorneys or their planners or or other uh, professionals. Uh, some do not. And the other thing is what you end up with is in a state as diverse as New Jersey, you could have literally 565 different ordinances. And that really doesn't work. It will drive the courts crazy in addition to really uh, administration of those regulations will be a problem. So what in certain instances, either aspect, all aspects or some aspects of a law are subject to uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, possibly suggested or recommended ordinance terms and conditions. Uh, this has been used, for example, with, uh, well, more recently, it's been used, for example, with the cannabis law. It was used with, it's been used with respect to transfer development rights. Uh, it's now part of the municipal land use law, but at one point there were model ordinances as to that. Those of us who are like me, old timers in land use remember transfer of development rights at the end of the 80s and early 90s, and then it was all the rage. And that was a big subject for, for model ordinances. So we have that here. Um, you know, we, 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 you know, we have that here. In addition to, I mean, we will, we will touch on that. One of the things I think it's important to realize is that what we're doing, not what we're doing, what, what the state has done. The state long ago declared as a matter of public policy that we're advancing the needs, uh, advancing our environmental needs, and also you know, creating clean, trans clean transportation alternatives. And you know, frankly, that's not just about New Jersey. That's a, that's a, federal, that's a federal policy now, and it has been for many years. I mean, you know, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, 
it is it is a federal it is it is federal policy and you know under the supremacy clause the states are uh the states are obliged to go in the same direction and that's what we're doing uh you know federalism allows municipality allows uh states to uh allows states to go their own way to some extent but consistency is important so think of it as a as a, as a top down some may not like this it's a top-down policy but it's being implemented by the states in accordance with their own resources and uh, uh, expertise so that's really how we do that uh, it is the in my opinion the use of a uh, of a model ordinance is very important because it gives everybody some guidelines that are and really it gives fairly hard guidelines while there can be some alternatives or some you know individual uh uh drafting you know it kind of gives the floor it gives the bottom line that you know that really that everybody has to uh, comply with in that in that regard it's not much different than for example your master plan law under section 23 of the mlul where it indicates what must be in a master plan or what can be in a master plan this ordinance will indicate this ordinance will indicate you know what what must be done and you know in, in, in other regards it, it will indicate framework for where a municipality might be able to go on its own exactly and and, and that's and that's great for our next slide cliff um also there was uh, another poll that was done i believe the results are being shown now 13%, I guess, have adopted an ordinance. They've adopted the more, they've adopted, in fact, the model ordinance, which is great. Okay. And 1% 1, 1 with permitted amendments, which is, which I think is about what we figured it would be. Uh, you know, there will be some unique circumstances to a municipality that will dictate perhaps going in a different direction. But the, but the, the fundamental, but the fundamentals of the ordinance are are you know are there and should be adopted yeah and if there's questions as to what they are you should coordinate that with your with your officials and attorney yeah and also one of the and getting into the next slide one of the things that we we want to emphasize and and we've gotten some guidance from from dca is is that you you do not have to formally adopt this ordinance for it to be in place it is essentially already in place and Sometimes when we think about what a model ordinance is, we might, or what a model ordinance might not be, we, we tend to think of model ordinances as uh, basically like a, a tool, um, sort of like best management practices in terms of the framework of, of, of doing something. Well, while th that, this ordinance has some elements of that, I'm probably about 95% of it is, is mandated. And there is a little bit of that wiggle room, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. But we wanted to emphasize that you don't technically have to have your town uh, adopt it. If you do, then um, you know you could cross-reference in it in your ordinance. You could do all the different things, uh, stating it in different uh, zones, and all the things that might be very helpful to you administratively. Or you could just administer this ordinance as is learn some of the lessons from it and see what you might want to do going into the into the future. Uh, so uh, it's mandatory, it's effective. Uh, this supersedes any existing municipal EV charging ordinances that you already that you already had on the books. Um, uh, Cliff, did you want to briefly touch upon that at all? Uh, you mean the terms and conditions of the ordinance itself, or no? In, in terms of superseding, just making it very clear to yes. Everyone. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. I mean, the the you know the the terms of the the the, the terms themselves are self evident, but yes, it's intended that uh, if you have an ordinance, if you've adopted an ordinance under Section forty forty eight under NJSA forty forty eight, uh, in essence. This enactment, this model ordinance will will supersede. It may end up supplementing what you're doing. It may end up, it may end up simply creating something that wasn't there before. Or, 
but it will in any event, its terms and conditions will override, will override what, uh, what's already in place. Uh, exactly. So I, I think it's important about to understand that this, this has already been resolved. I mean, I, I it's not, uh, it's not a situation where someone should be saying, well, it's not the law. Well, it is law. And, uh, yeah, and, and everyone was shared a copy of it of, as, as part of this. And then we'll also make sure that it's available. So the hope is that everyone, um, you know, after this webinar, certainly go through it, read it. If you have any questions or concerns, we're going to be going over it, um, kind of the nuts and bolts and everything. Uh, there are sections that are mandated and that cannot be changed. And then there is a section, section F that can be changed. There's some wiggle room in terms of if you do adopt it as an ordinance, uh, you can do some changes to the purpose and the reasons of, of why. But the state did, a, in my opinion, did a pretty good job kind of setting up a nice template for you. And then they also, even in the mandated sections, they also have it set up that um, you can kind of plug in the different sections of your ordinance that might possibly sort of um, need to be connected there. I want to add something, David, that we we need to, we should touch on. One of the things about the model ordinance is that uh, I believe pretty pretty certainly that uh, the intention of the the model ordinance was to, in addition to whatever it may whatever it may accomplish independently, it is it advances the purposes of the municipal land use law under section. NJSA 40 colon 55D-2. If you're familiar with those, as I'm sure nearly all of us are, uh, you know, environmental considerations and clean energy, you know, clean, clean energy and uh, issues such as that are expressly declared to be uh, the policy and the goals of the MLUL. So this is this is in, in essence you should consider it as part and parcel of your MLU of of the MLU as of now. Uh, so anyway, go ahead, David. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh no, that, that's fine. And and we're also going to try to get some resources out there so that you can. I mean, for the most part, in terms of um, the different sections. So there's different. So the sections C, D, and E are basically word for word what was in the original legislation, and then everything else the DCA built everything around that in order to try to um, make the ordinance, make the model ordinance, and then plug different things in to kind of connect it. Uh, but they, they did initially have to base it on the original language that's, that's in there. So uh, ne mm -hmm. next. I do see, let's stay here, dude. I do see they put the um, model ordinance link in the chat. So if any of you have not seen that or can't find it in the invitation, you can click on that. Uh, it'll open, I believe, in a Word document. Um, to what the regulations are there. Um, if you're keeping your municipality compliant, and this is kind of where NJPZA saw our opportunity to speak to the group about the, the EV model ordinance. I mean, as we keep referencing, there's a lot of great resources from DEP and, and DCA um, about the goals of this plan and, and how this came to be. But we're trying to say, okay, so now you have this new ordinance that you're in charge of enforcing and and knowing all the ins and outs of uh, here, at, you know, at your municipality. So how can uh, we support you in doing that? The first thing is making sure everyone, you know, in house within your municipality is aware. Um, in reading through the guidelines, you know, that would include the zoning official, any land use administrators um, or support staff you may have, your construction code official. Um, also, the subcodes, the electrical official would certainly be involved um, in aspects of this. So all of these people within your municipality now have to be aware that this exists, what the regulations are, need to come up with some kind of plan on how this is going to be handled, you know, in-house. Uh, from the, one of the previous polls, we saw not a ton of towns have already adopted this, but hopefully those discussions are taking place now. I know in my municipality, we have not adopted it yet, but it's being reviewed, deciding if we're going to edit any of the sections we are able to or adopt as it was presented. Um, so I feel like that's where a lot of us are, but looking at it now and identifying, you know, places where you see issues for your town or things you're unclear of, is a great time to look at it prior to it being adopted. 
Um, I think even for those who, who did adopt it with no changes, you know, as you implement it and work with it, you know, maybe there's some things that make sense to add later on for your township. Um, so next slide, David. So continuing in that, that same vein, uh, I'm sure we're all very familiar, especially those of you who uh, are a board secretary or a zoning official, even before the legislation was really passed for the, uh, the cannabis and, and marijuana laws, you are inundated with calls. The public is calling you, interested parties are calling you, concerned residents are calling you, wanting to know what this you know, proposed legislation could mean for them. Uh, same thing here, you know, knowing that there's a new ordinance that is in effect that I am now responsible for enforcing, uh, that my township is in, responsible for being in compliance with deadlines and things like that, you know, is a big responsibility. Uh, so you want to make sure everybody who is involved, as we highlight on the last slide here, with this ordinance, you know, has looked through it. Uh, feels comfortable with what's in there. If not, again, reach out to your professionals or your you know, attorney, uh, administrator, whoever that might be at your town to kind of make sure you guys have a plan in place. The time to come up with the plan is not when the first EV charging application comes in. I know some of you work with these regularly and this is not you know, a new thing, but maybe some of our more rural towns, um, you haven't had an electric charging application. And certainly, if maybe you've had them at the board level, but not coming in, uh, being an administrative approval or a zoning approval as the ordinance dictates, and that we'll get into later on here. So this will be a new role for uh, some of us. So you want to make sure you're checking, you know, what what needs to be looked at as part of these applications, and that you feel comfortable with that. Uh, maybe even just an informal meeting with the. Uh, officials at your township saying, okay, when this comes in, are we reviewing this concurrently, uh, meaning the construction office and zoning? And David will get more into the timelines for the review later on in the presentation. Um, but it's important to have some kind of proactive approach on how you're gonna deal with this. Because as we said, if you've adopted it or not, it is in effect. All right, so here uh, we, you have the link to the ordinance, but just kind of highlight some of the sections that it's broken down into. Um, I found it was similar to uh, some of the ordinances that my township does, where it starts with the introduction and the purpose, then gets into the definitions, uh, which is nice here. They've defined all the terms that they go through uh, within the ordinance. Um, some of those, as I was reading it, you know, looked them up and uh, saw what those would be. Um, David will get into those a little bit more in a later slide. Um, then there's the sections that are mandatory that we touched upon, which are the approvals and permits. And that's really where we're going to focus a lot of our discussions today, because that's what these municipal officials, um, you know, in-house municipalities will be char charged with doing now that we have this uh, model ordinance on the books. So what's required uh, for a complete application? And if you don't have a, a complete application, you know, how are you to communicate that to the applicant? There's guidance around that as well. Uh, another mandatory section is the installation requirements of these uh, make ready spaces, uh, the minimum parking requirements. Uh, and then lastly, it will go into the reasonable standards for all of the, the new EV, SE and make ready parking spaces. And that is where some um, flexibility is given to the townships to add their own. Uh, guidelines there. Um, but again, that might be something that doesn't develop or or see really what you want to change until you start working with these applications. This, this is new for everybody. Uh, so I think these questions are going to come up as we as we go through this and start really getting into some applications here. Okay, so now we're going to get into it. Um, so just kind of wanted to touch on some some key definitions, an electric vehicle. Uh, so specifically what we're talking about is, uh, well, there's a little bit of flexibility here because a plug-in can also be a hybrid. It could be, uh, so it could be partially uh, electrical, meaning that it can also plug in 
but it could also have gasoline or, or another form, or it could be 100% plug-in. So when we're talking about electric vehicles, uh, it could be fully or partially. When we're talking about the, uh, the new buzz acronym now that everyone's gonna be saying EVSE, that stands for electric vehicle supply equipment. And so that's basically everything that needs to be uh, you know, running from the building to or from wherever the utilities to the location of the actual charging equipment. It covers everything. When we talk about make ready spaces, well, what does that mean? So make ready space is basically everything but the charger. So especially when we're talking about uh, new construction, when new construction is happening, what's so important about capturing those in terms of uh, making sure that they're make ready is while a lot of the site work is being done, you already have these trenches that could be done before all the improvements are put on top of it. The sidewalks, the grass, the trees, everything else, you know, the parking lot. So it's really, really critical to have this uh, uh, make ready spaces be done. You might not even know it's a space that's ready, but on the plans and the work that's being done underground, uh, it's going to be ready for, for future expansion. All right. So uh, in terms of the approvals and the permits, just a little bit of an, of an overview on all of this. So one of the major things that the legislation did, and including in this ordinance, is EV, SE, and make ready parking spaces. It's, it's a permitted accessory use in all zones, everywhere. Um, it's no site plan is required. No land use board review is required. No variance required. This applies to both existing buildings and to new buildings. And we're gonna start to go through uh, kind of breaking that down next. So in terms of existing buildings, now you, you may chuckle to yourself when you read this when basically it says, okay, existing buildings, which ex existing buildings are we talking about? Well, they wanted to specifically identify gasoline service stations and retail establishments, but then they also identified that it's any other existing building. So really it, it's basically all, all existing buildings and even speaking to the DCA, there, isn't, there wasn't an intent to prohibit, say, a parking lot that doesn't have any building on it. There wasn't the intent, like when they started using this language talking about what existing buildings, to some degree, they were basically talking about like an existing developed site. Um, and I'm gonna go a little bit more into this and, and, and how the state is hopeful even through this model ordinance and trying to emphasize ways that the officials reviewing it can find ways to say yes rather than no. Uh, they do certainly recognize that um, this is kind of a new thing for everyone to go through, and we're not going to really know some of the challenges that might be out there, but they, the state is really encouraging uh, flexibility. So even in something like this, and we're going to be talking to DCA and possibly getting some, uh, you know, updated written correspondence from them that could be some, some backup clarifications for some of this. But when you think of existing, uh, think of this as existing sites, developed sites that already have site plans essentially. Um, so this is, these are places, a lot of times it might be a, a big shopping center for you where they're going to wanna come in and put in parking spaces. Here in Hillsborough, we have um, uh, our Coles, our Coles parking lot uh, recently received an application where they're converting a number of those spots. And we're starting to see a lot more, a, a lot more of that. So existing sites. So what's the process for existing sites? Because the other, the other possibility is, is anything that's new, meaning uh, going through site plan right now and incorporating uh, EV charging stations as part of that. And we're going to go into that a little bit, a couple slides. But right now, the, the big focus is, is basically on retrofitting existing sites. So the, they have the right to come in and to put this request into you. And a zoning permit is required. 
However, the process is going to be a little bit different than your normal zoning permit application. As a lot of you know, a zoning permit application generally is uh, 10 business days that you have to review it before it's, it's automatically approved if you don't reach a decision. Uh, even though this does require a zoning permit, there, there is an additional built-in time. Uh, instead of the 10 days, they actually have a process where they're actually setting it up as a completeness review. So the completeness review has a 20 day maximum re review time. And part of the process of deeming the application complete will be uh, receiving the permit fee. And I believe also through the ordinance, you'll have the power to change your fees if you're going to treat uh, these potentially differently than maybe how you do some of your other, other zoning permits. The other requirements are all the necessary documentation. So for those of you who might be reviewing, um, you know, site plan applications and things like that, think of this as kind of like a mini version of that. And so all the necessary documentation, I went through the ordinance to try to, to, try to figure out well, what might be some of the necessary documentation. So a lot of those, a lot of those things are going to be, you know, the location layout plan, um, you know, going through and just making sure that you have in your documentation what you need in order to deem it complete. The other part about existing sites is uh, it's not subject to the parking requirements. And that's important to remember, there's a difference between the existing and the new. There are going to be parking requirements uh, when it related to the new, but when it comes to someone coming in to a, an existing site and wanting to solely put in charging infrastructure, it's not subject to the parking requirements. So going through the completeness of review, the ordinance also sets it up as there's a notice of incompleteness that has to be uh, provided. Uh, it's a one-time written correction notice. And if it's not issued after filing it, um, you know, basically it's deemed complete. Now we have to get some clarification from DCA because when you read this section, it talks, everything it says is talking about completeness. It doesn't truly go into really talking about, well, what about this compliance review? When does the compliance review come in where you're, you're looking at it to see if not just that it meets completeness in terms of they've given you everything in order to do your compliance review, but we need to get more clarification from them. They do mention in terms of the section for compliance, you know, you need to make sure that it's not violating uh, bulk requirements. And, and, and bulk requirements, for a lot of you, a parking lot, especially a traditional strip mall where the buildings are in the back, a lot of times certain bulk requirements might not apply to the parking lot. So just keep that in mind. I think they put a lot of this language in there just to kind of like as a buffer, just in case of, as an added protection for the town. So the other emphasis is on conditions of approval. So all conditions of prior approvals need to be met. So there will be some time that you're going to have to dedicate looking at some other, some, some of the historic approvals that have been received for, for that site. Um, they also put in that it needs to comply with the UCC, but for zoning officials, for those of us that are not construction officials, we're not going to know if it complies with the UCC. So you could put that as a condition approval in your, in your permit. We have some draft language that we're gonna share with you in a little bit, uh, which is actually now. So um, in early September, I had to do one of these permits and I wanted to share with you a little bit of what, of what I put in the zoning permit. This is still a learning process. So I didn't get it exactly right. So I made a few tweaks here. So this is just an example, you know, a description um, again, new, incorporating new language in there, talking about um, the different, we didn't get into this, but there's different levels of, of chargers. And the more information that you could put on the permit to kind of lock it up is better, as a lot of you know. Also, what I built in there was all conditions of prior approval shall be met, uh, shall comply with the construction codes, UCC. And then the, the section I was citing, because we don't have it adopted here in Hillsborough, specifically put in the section of the MLUL where, where this comes from. And I also cited the DCA model ordinance and specifically dated it because it's adopted September 1st. Uh, DCA did say that um, over time they may update it, 
So I think it is important to put that data in there so that we know which which version we're we're working with. Right now it's easy because there's only one there's only one version. Okay, so going into the requirements for new installations. So the state spelled out basically, they really wanted to emphasize multiple dwellings. And if you recall in the first few slides, as part of the energy goals, they have one of their goals is they wanted to make sure a certain percentage of the multiple family dwellings are definitely getting chargers. We wanted to make sure that uh, folks living in those types of buildings have accessibility. So they very much wanted to spell it out here. And so how they have this is, is basically as a condition of preliminary site plan approval, applications involving new multiple dwelling units, uh, five or more, uh, these are the requirements. So there's immediate responsibility essentially to make it uh, make ready. And here's all the percentages and how many of the parking spaces you have to do. And then it, this, these are the time periods that the person that the developer has to do. And I think a lot of this, if you could incorporate it into your permits, the more that you could cite it, the, the more helpful that will be. And then other. So the other is, is basically uh, everything else. And so at least 5% of, of it have, oh, excuse me. So another part of this is overall, 5% of the, of the charging station spaces have to be accessible with people with disabilities. So you look at that total number and then they are responsible to make sure that 5% of them. Uh, nothing is stopping someone from going at a faster place into actually installing these. Um, so the requirements. So then there's also requirements for any application involving a garage or a parking lot. So again, you're gonna see similar language here. These people are calling me, apologize. Um, so here is a table to kind of, you know, show uh, this, again, this is all in the ordinance, but we created this to try to make it a little bit easier to understand. And so these are all the minimum requirements of what someone has to do. And then basically once you get over that 150 parking space mark, it goes into percentages. And you could see from the 101 to 150 spots, there is a responsibility to make sure that um, you're making it accessible to people with disabilities. And then you could see the above 150 with the 5% as well. So um, continuing on, on this, um, in lieu of installing the make ready parking spaces, um, you, you know, instead of make ready, someone could fully put in the infrastructure. There's nothing stopping that. It does, they're on the hook to, to do it at least make ready at first, but nothing is stopping them from, from going all the way and putting it in or doing it at a faster plate, at a faster, um, at a faster pace. There are exemptions to this. So shall not be required to provide or install any of these. And that's for retailers that are 25 or fewer off street parking spaces. And, um, you know, I assume, and we'll get clarification on this, but if you're talking about a, a retailer that's within a greater shopping center, I think we're talking about the space of that retailer in terms of the 25 spots, not that they might be in a parking lot of 300, 400 parking spaces. I think that's gonna be an important thing to kind of keep your, keep your eyes on. Also, um, the developer or owner of, of single family homes, this, this doesn't apply to that. David, before we move on from that, uh, I saw some questions that are coming in around these calculations and things. Um, and I know in your discussions with the DCA on this, uh, you know, they understood that there'd be some questions about this when you actually get down to calculating these for real life uses and things like that. Um, is this something they plan to maybe give some clarification on or more examples? Yeah. Parts? Yes. Yeah, so the DCA fully intends to come out with some uh, best management practices, and uh, we hope to have an opportunity to help share some of that, especially as you get your questions into us, we could help shape that hopefully in a, in a really positive way. But yes, there, there are going to, there is going to be more guidance on this. And again, if you think this is moving fast, you're right, it is moving fast. And I think it's just because of the importance uh, and what we're sort of up against with, with some of these timelines. I'm not sure, David, I'm not sure we touched uh, just yeah, briefly 
remember that when you're processing one of these applications, and this is going to be something that you're you're probably going to have questions. This does not an app. You know, for example, if someone's working with an existing site, which is what you're going to have, I think, on the initial applications, you're going to have a great deal more of that rather than starting from ground zero by a property owner. Uh, remember that you know nothing that's in this ordinance and nothing in the legislation or regulatory uh, scheme uh, waives or exempts or extinguishes any existing conditions of approval or previous approvals on the property in question. We all know that if you get, for example, a shopping center or a Wawa or a gas station or whatever, someplace that has a lot of parking, there may be previous approvals. And as we all know, some of those conditions are, you know, those conditions run with the land. They are not changed in any way by, uh, by what you would do in connection with a permit involving this new model ordinance. So, and, and really there's no discretion to make any changes in those conditions. So, so I just wanna make sure that's, that's made clear. Yeah, and you, might, and you all may be asking yourselves, well, what possible conditions could possibly stop someone from putting in some of these charging stations? And, and the answer really is we don't exactly know. And especially when the legislation is also saying like, if you could really avoid saying no, please don't say no. Um, so it's really going to be a learning experience. As if you right. do with those, with those ones, those potential red flags, please let us know so that we can let DCA know. Now, before I, I on, I, oh, I'm sorry, Cliff. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that the approach to this is permissive rather than restrictive Correct. in terms yeah. of what we're trying to do. Uh, right. I just, I just want you know, I, you know, I, I'm with the program on that at all. But I, uh, it, it, you know, what, what, it, what is in place still exists, and and of course we can all those of us who have you talked about Hillsboro, they have you know many retail shopping centers and things like this, auto repair facilities. Uh, you know, there, there are you know many different types of uses where. There might be conditions that are, you know, that are uh, that transcend really the uh, you know the property and 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 run and, and of course as a matter of law run with the land. So you have to be, right. you have to be very uh, very you have, you have, yeah you have to be respectful of that. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, th thank you, Cliff. And um, uh, before we move on, so we have another poll. Uh, we we're curious to see what everyone would say, and it. Basically, you you would like help and resources for everything. So we're being charged with that, and and we're proud to be able to try to clarify uh, and help you <coughs> for your feedback. All right. So so before we move on, I just wanted to emphasize basically everything we're talking about up to this point has pretty much been mandated. You can't really change. But I did want to bring uh, to you everyone's attention. So it's going to be section F. So when you specifically look at uh, section F, and that's gonna be other health and safety related specifications. So we're talking, you know, parking space identification, the wayfinding signage, adequate sight lighting and landscaping, um, you know, basically the, the, the connector, the, the design of the equipment uh, and accessibility in terms of how you're able to get to these. So um, a lot of that you're going to be able to look in there. If you, I'll just give, because we're a little short on time, to give you a quick example. Right now, the the ordinance, bottle ordinance, basically says that the parking spots have to be green and have to have a symbol that's green. Now, you know, you might want to go in there and say, we don't want green parking spots. We want to do signage and, you know, that's fine. That's probably one of those things that's really not too big of, of an issue. But I guess when the state came up with the bottle ordinance, they wanted to at least set it up so that we had a starting point. So just know that you could go into those sections and you could start to identify potentially uh, what you might want to do. But again, the important thing to stress is um, you cannot create something that's going to create uh, potential barriers like having to go to a board or anything like that that's going to delay the, the process. You really want to focus on the health, safety, and general welfare in terms of um, you know, really emphasizing what's what's important. We, but we don't want to stop the potential progress. So moving forward, I'm moving forward. 
there's also a, a, a specific section on the parking requirements and we have to get a little bit more clarification from the state on that. There's, there's um, a little bit of confusion on, on what it really applies to and, and how the calculations really exactly work. We're gonna be sharing with DCA basically how a lot of, a lot of us, uh, the formulas we use to calculate and try to come up with some kind of template to show like how, how does the law in terms of, of the calculation, how does it all apply? So more to come on that. So one of the really big things that we wanted to share with everyone is, well, what is the effective date? So the eff effective date, according to DCA, and we're actually waiting for them to put this in, put this in writing, but the, and, and please, everyone, please don't take action on this yet until we get further clarification from DCA. Yes, but exactly. according to DCA, the act, it's retroactive to July 9th, meaning if, someone did not have a decision yet, they are on the hook for these requirements. So time of application rule does not apply according to the state. The state did go and get some, um, some guidance on that. And we're hopeful that they're going to be getting us some information as well. So the DCA to release uh, more of that so please don't take action. Uh, please don't start contacting anyone that has any of those approvals yet. Um, but for right now, this is this is what we're we're being told, and and this is all of the the new, it, essentially the new site plans. They're going to be on the hook for having to do uh, the certain percentage of make ready and eventually charging stations. Okay, Christina. All right. Uh, so yeah, so just what David was just finishing up there uh, when we were preparing for this presentation, you know, Cliff made it very clear that consult with your municipal attorney, your board attorneys, things like that, you know, about applications you have pending, what date they came in and, and if this would apply to that, you know, before you proceed with anything there. Um, so now that we have this, how can we successfully implement this and streamline it for all? And for all, we mean not just internally with our municipal teams and our reviews, but for applicants that come in. You know, nobody wants to be the town that's difficult and the one next door made it so easy and now you're giving me a hard time trying to get my charging stations on this project. Um, having a model ordinance should really help with a lot of that. But I think the more that you get together with your team prior to these applications or when you have an application and decide how this is going to work. Uh, David spoke to how it's a 20 day timeline for this and that is for the zoning review only. That does not also account for any construction reviews that also have to take place. Um, but perhaps, you know, given the fact that there are some UCC stuff kind of weaved in here, is that maybe a good time to show the application to a construction official, get some input there and say, hey, you see any red flags here as I do this review? Um, you know, because this is new to everybody. Um, so it's not day 20 and then we see, oh, there's, there's some other kind of large problem here. Um, an interesting thing uh, from the model ordinance, uh, it might be how some of you operate. It is not how I operate, where if I've got an application that's pretty deficient, a zoning application, um, it's highlighted that they're incomplete and you know, generally what sections they need to complete. Uh, a full review is not conducted because all the documents are not there. But in the model ordinance, it does speak to the fact that you need to issue an incomplete letter specifically detailing everything that this application is deficient in. So really giving the applicant um, a checklist or a bulleted list of everything they need to submit to you for this to be a complete application and for the review to commence uh, with no further information needed. So that might be your process already, but if it's not, you really have to make sure you look at what they've submitted, go through everything you're expecting to review and detail that all in the list because that will keep you compliant with what the model ordinance is asking you to do here. Um, so I know on my end, I plan on making some kind of checklist for these applications. And perhaps there may be a more formal one or a best practices moving forward for that. But initially, you know, I know what elements I plan to review to make sure they're compliant with the guidelines in the model ordinance, that they're compliant with any previous resolutions 
or rules for this property. Um, I'm gonna reference those as David mentioned in my decision language, a condition on the permit or something else. So they know this is not uh, any kind of waiver or, or excuse you from anything that was previously uh, decided upon for this site as part of your approvals. Uh, so really having clear guidelines for yourself and for the applicant. So when you give that nice detailed list and they give you all of those items, it's going to make the town seem more friendly. They're going to be happy with the process instead of this uh, piecemeal kind of back and forth uh, that sometimes happens. So you may have to go a little more above and beyond than you typically would with reviewing these applications uh, than other deficient zoning applications you get into your office. Yeah, this may be further complicated a little bit, and I just want to touch on this briefly. Uh, as you as you all know, uh, you know our Supreme Court a couple of years ago kind of reemphasized the importance and the discretion of uh, administrative officials in the zoning process, and you know that certainly is not changed by this. I mean, your discretion is, I mean, certainly within within appropriate reasons within, you know, within the bounds of the ordinance, your discretion is still acceptable and, and, and encouraged. This is not form-based zoning, I guess is, is what I'm trying to say in a nice way. This is not uh, something where, you know, you're being told to do something without any consideration. It's, there is a, you know, you, you do have a role in this and, and uh, it is uh, discretionary rather than ministerial. So... Go ahead. No, absolutely. And I, when we were formulating the program, you know, that leads to some of your advisory boards, you know, maybe still getting this application. Yeah. They can provide their comments and things like that, but um, it, it doesn't, you don't have to trump all of your, your processes you typically have in place for applications. Yes, this, this does not say, for example, your Historic Preservation Commission and environmental commissions, as you're all aware, where our advisory boards, they certainly are allowed to comment as necessary. At the end of the day, though the comments are not dispositive, the decision is the decision can be made, uh, you know, considering them. But 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 you know, they cannot stop an application or deny an application unilaterally or something like this. They're your discretion, you know, their role remains as 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 limited under the existing statutes in the MLUL. Thanks. What's this? All right. Uh, so you know, a lot of information here today. As David talked about earlier, uh, this is is new to all of us. You know, from looking at some of the polls, a lot of the towns have not formally adopted this yet, it doesn't mean you, you know, haven't had applications come in or that you're not subject to these rules, uh, but we're all on the same page of, of starting to, you know, work with these guidelines and make this as, as uniform and, and as streamlined of a process as we can as municipal officials, um, you know, for the applicants and internally. So some of the takeaways are, you know, get with your team internally, figure out how you're going to work with this. Um, and then see what kind of um, guidelines and resources you can put in place to help the applicants. You, you want to you know, be a public servant and help those that come in. Um, and you want to make sure you're compliant with all of the elements that are, are in the model ordinance here. And also for those of you who might not be officials that are, that are on, this, uh, on this webinar, um, we hope what you took away from this is kind of seeing even though there's all this legislation enabling this to happen, there's even the ordinance as we just went over it, you could see that when you really dive into it, there are still sometimes some complications that it's, it's not an easy process. There's different people that are involved in, in writing this, and then it ultimately falls on uh, the officials who have to review all of it and try to make sense of it. And so there, there's definitely going to be a, a bit of a learning curve if you are someone that's going to be installing this on your property, if you're a business owner or a developer, you know, we just ask that you have um, communication with the officials, maybe instead of 
applying right away, have a conversation with the official, kind of go over and then make yourself very aware of what the requirements are and try to help that official out. Give them as much information as, as possible. You know, give them a good opportunity to re review as much of it as they can. There's no advantage to any town for any of us to be denying these. Uh, it's just going to create more paperwork for, for everyone. Uh, so, so yeah, so I, I think this was a really unique kind of letting people in on, on sort of the, the challenges that we face as, as officials and, and trying to uh, do our jobs, our responsibilities, protect our towns and do the right thing. Um, so uh, it was really a pleasure. Yes, and just a, a bit of housekeeping here. If you uh, do have additional questions, you know, well, NJPZ did not, not formulate this. We're here to support the municipal officials that are tasked with now enforcing this, being compliant with this gui these guidelines. Uh, so happy to start, you know, uh, compiling any questions and things like that and hope to get some clarification back for our group. So we have a contact us function on our website, which is njapza.org. You can submit questions there and we'd be happy to try to help facilitate uh, getting some answers there. Um, also throughout our group, good opportunity to network with each other, uh, especially since we're all following a similar or you know, pretty much the same ordinance here. Um, your other colleagues and neighboring towns and across the state really are good resources for you here and happy to help you uh, connect with other land use officials. So we're very thankful for the opportunity to, to come and speak with the group today. Um, and now I think we have some time for Q&A. Um, I understand many of you had to go. It was a one hour session for one CE credit, but if anyone wants to stay on for a bit and uh, go through some questions, we are available to do so. Thank you so much, all three of you. That was wonderful information. And we have some great questions in the Q&A. Did, did the three of you wanna take a look at those and start fielding? Sure, so we're just yes. opening that if you all don't mind, let's see. The first one uh, from, uh, I'll take the first one if, I, if that's all right. Um, does DCA or NJA PZA have questions and answers available online to address some of the questions related to the model ordinance? DCA at this time does not have like sample questions and answers, but they do have a very, but they do have a very, uh, I think, informative section uh, on their on their website. And I think I'm trying to look. Well, I've we can always send that along with the slides or give that to Sarah Catherine right. to provide. Yeah, and, and, and like I said earlier, we're we're going to have a dialogue with DCA. They already know that we're going to bring a bunch of questions to them, and we're going to figure out how we get those answers back to everyone. Right. Yeah. I want. I, I. I. thought I'd just try to kick us off with the, with with that being the first question. How about the yeah. questions about parking requirements? Okay. Let's see here. Does that if you please explain not you. subject to parking requirements? Does that mean if you take up existing spaces, that does not reduce or otherwise affect the overall parking count for compliance purposes? Well, correct. So for existing, for existing, they have it explicitly written that you you can't you can't do a parking calculation for it. Like what they're trying to do is to not have people interpret a EV space as being something that's taking away a space from the rest of the site. Matter of fact, when you go to the section on parking requirements, which we still have to get clarification from DCA on, they're actually counting one EV space actually as two spots. So what happens is if you have, let's say a hundred parking spots at a site, and if someone uh, takes 10 of them and makes 10 of them EV charging spaces, technically the, the calculation is now um, those 10 now count as 20. So for the purposes of calculations, the, they have now increased. Now, how do we administer that, all of that? Um, and that's what we're going to get clarification on. So we more information to come. Uh, great question. I see a really interesting question, uh, Michael Hafner. 
I do not see where the model ordinance addresses advertising screens on these charging stations. We are seeing these stations with LCD, uh, LCD screen scrolling advertising. Yeah, so wonderful question. Uh, in reviewing this ordinance, I have not seen anything on that. Perhaps that may fall into the purview of the, um, the section that you can potentially update. We will uh, get clarification on that one. Mm -hmm. And then also I see a question, is there grace periods from the adoption dates shown on the screen? So we're not seeing any grace periods. I mean, we're a little bit, just to be honest with you, we're kind of, our initial thought was, this was effective September 1st, well, the ordinances. We didn't know the impact of the actual legislation in terms of it being um, when it would go into effect, which DCA reminded us and said politely, actually it's July 9th. So, so again, there, but there's no grace period. There's no extended time. It's basically if a, a new application doesn't have its resolution or didn't receive its verbal approval, then they are essentially on the hook for these requirements. Yep, yes. Okay, so let's see here, um, since I'm on a roll. On charging stations, I understand that they are exempt from parking requirements, but what about if the equipment is taking up spots? Well, that, so that's an excellent question. Um, potentially, I, I don't, I haven't seen where the spots, I mean, this equipment is so sophisticated and so um, designed to be accommodated in different scenarios where you might have a, a basically double parking spots, you know, facing uh, parking spots facing each other and the equipment can actually fit in in between. Um, there might be challenges where there might potentially be reduction in some of the parking spaces because there is a requirement that these spots can't be any smaller than nine by 18. So in some situations, you may have a reduction of the parking spots, and that's probably something you do need to look at. And uh, please contact us, and we'll get that clarification to DCA. Basically, again, this is so new to everyone. So as you're, you're all at the front lines, so the information you're getting is so, so valuable. So, so please share it with us so it can help everyone else. Okay, let's see. So we got similar questions. All right, let's see here. Uh, applicant for new multifamily construction or commercial development needs to contain EV parking spots on the site plan. Uh, yes, we agree. Um, oh, Cliff, we have an attorney. If you wanted to take this one, I, I could read it to you. Um, it's from Christopher. No, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. Thank you. Um, okay. I'll let me read it out loud. How, what about the possible need for site plan and variance approvals for EV charges where other land development ordinance standards might apply, such as setbacks, impervious coverage signs, offsite advertising signs? In other words, do the new law and model ordinance still permit a municipality to require such additional approvals? I would say, I, I would say that the answer is the the new I would say the new model ordinance uh, site a site plan approval is no longer required as a matter of law. So I would say the answer is is that uh, there's there's going to be a certain exemption. I am sure that this is going to get litigated. I'm going to tell you this for forgetting for a minute that I'm discussing it as a zoning official, as a lawyer. I am certain that the developers bar will try to see what they can do in terms of reconciling approvals with, uh, uh, you know, with existing, you know, with, with existing uh, ordinances. But I think I think the intent of the law is that site plan you know, site plan ordinances or site plan ordinances are going to be bypassed. I think that's the intent of the law. Now the question is going to be, will there be a uh, you know, will there be pushback on this? There could be. Yeah, in, in the same vein, we had some questions and we spoke to it a bit about, uh, I think it was from Nidella, about Historic Preservation Commission review and approval required for new EV on residential property and historic district, full hearing or administrative review. I think we've touched that this has to be an administrative review uh, this could still go to historic preservation for their 
input and perhaps there's some, I guess, maybe they want some buffering or something like that. They can certainly still give their input cliff, right, on that? Yes, they certainly can. I mean, this is not, you know, this is not trying to balkanize one, one uh, group against another. But inf input can always be solicited. But I, I do believe the... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You go first. I do believe the intent of the law was to try to facilitate the process rather than use, uh, uh, as, as has been the problem in some instances, than to use regulation to, to you know, in essence, occlude it, to uh, block it or slow it down. Yeah, I was just gonna add that I'm actually secretary of my town's Historic Preservation Commission and um, I know that at least in our town, it's a little different for each town, but like the Secretary of Interior guidelines is mostly about like materials on the house itself and signs and fencing. Um, so I right. think, you know, when you um, like add something like a charger, that's probably not something that I imagine a commission would really block um, since it's not directly affecting like the materials of the house or the appearance or anything. It differs from town to town. Correct. No, I agree with you. I don't. Th I think that would be kind of outside the jurisdiction. I believe would be outside the jurisdiction of an HPC. Um, and 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 uh, you know, there it's hard to uh, opine on something like that when it really isn't an historical artifact or part of an historical uh, scenario. Yeah, re really good uh, insight. Sorry, Catherine. All right, so another question we have here um, uh, from my former colleague here, Patrick Gorman. Uh, could a potential developer utilize uh, banked parking for fulfilling to make the uh, to make ready space for? Yeah, I can't see why not. I mean, bank parking that's is right. yeah. of the parking that's part of the site plan, so I, I can't see why not. And maybe there's some advantage to that because it it hasn't been constructed yet. So perhaps that would reduce some cost perhaps the owner of the property might want to focus on the bank parking, depending on how far away it is from the infrastructure. And that's, by the way, that's another thing that a lot of you are going to see is, um, you know, some people might be trying to run the electric from the building, but then some people might try to run the electric from the actual utility lines along the street. We're actually doing that in Hillsborough because we're actually saving some money rather than running it from the building all the way to the, to the spots we want to utilize. Uh, a lot of it's going to be based on, you know, cost and, and trying to do what sort of makes sense. So you, you may see different applications. You might be saying, oh, okay, maybe they're not all going to be super close to the building. Maybe they're going to be a little bit on the perimeter. And that might be because of uh, potential cost savings. Right. David, I agree with you. Yes, I think bank parking can certainly be used. It makes, it makes sense. Um, let's see here. So what was gone over was proposed proposed site. Is that correct? Um, okay. Will there be guidelines and timeframes for existing multifamily dwellings and retail establishments? So the way I'm reading the ordinance is unless an existing multifamily or retail establishment comes in, goes for a site plan, they're not on the hook to put in parking spaces. Um, Essentially, the existing section is talking about they have the ability to retrofit, go in there and retrofit their parking lot, do it if they want to. The obligation to do make ready spaces and to do charging stations falls on new applications. Right. And what's in the ordinance and, and, and what we talked a lot about as barriers during our, our talks with the DEP prior to this was... Uh, some of these business owners want to put these in for their customers or maybe um, office buildings want to put in for employees but didn't want to come in for the site plan. So that's where they put in that whole section that's an administrative approval um, for these existing uses, existing lots. So you know, to make it, to streamline it for them, make it cost effective for them to do it. A lot of them realize oh, if it's a site plan or a board trip, I, I, I'm not into it anymore. Right. Good. Good point, Christina. Right. No, I, I I do think that's a part of this as well. Is that the you know the back and forth that could take place, appeals, things like this. They're trying to limit those. 
Okay, uh, are there companies that are promoting building EVSE stations, expediters of the process? I'm not sure I understand the question. I don't know if that's in our vein, but maybe. I okay. wonder if they mean some of the vendors that we've featured on in our programs, like uh, a green spot mobility or Volta charging. That was actually the company referred to in the last question with the, the billboards, um, with the screens, that's how they offer free charging. So we, if maybe, um, I think that's Patricia, maybe Patricia can follow up with me, Leanne at ridewise.org and we can, um, you know, put you in touch with some companies or, or some information to learn more. We don't obviously support any specific vendors, but we're happy to share information um, that we know of. Yeah, and just, in case this, and just in case this sort of maybe answers it, uh, at least two of the charging companies that reached out to me uh, were not aware of the law. So I actually had to educate them and make, make them aware. And that's going to happen. So you're going to have some companies that are going to know and some companies that don't. They're just going to fill out a zoning permit and, you know, as if the law didn't exist. All right, so Sharon Keegan... My township grants variances a lot for parking space size. Is there a certain size that is required? So nine by 18 is the minimum size for a non, uh, say ADA parking space. The size for the ADA parking space is going to, um, it, you know, your con construction official is going to determine that. And it could be the one with the van and everything. I can't speak too much to that, but I can at least tell you that uh, I believe it's nine by 18 and please double check me, it, it is in the section of the parking requirements. So that is in there. Uh, okay, I know every, I would say, I know everyone's working to get through the electrification and inf infrastructure of regular vehicles. Is anyone considering infrastructure and parking spaces for commercial electric vehicles, medium heavy duty vehicles? These trucks can't fit most of the time enter premises of regular charging stations. Um, Ridewise, would you like to take that? One? Yeah, I was going to say this is this is right in your bailiwick. This is this is which question is this? So anonymous uh, attendee. Anonymous right? attendee. It says is I know everyone. Yeah, is working to get through uh, the electrification. Yes, and you know I we had somebody we had Moises Lukey on the who may still be with us who is actually the started a company called Supreme Green Team. They're going to be an all green um, trucking company and offer other services like charging for other commercial EV, um, EVs. Um, and that'll be based out of Newark, but in other locations as well. I'm thinking this is, um, if this isn't Moises, is somebody with sort of thinking along those lines. Um, we, I, can't really speak to this from my own experience, but I know that this is a topic that is on my radar and it was actually something I was considering uh, offering next month. So um, that is probably all I can say to that right now. So more to come on that one. More to come on that one, yes. And um, I do want to just say, actually, since I just took a look at the time and it is 1130, it's wonderful. We still have 63 uh, people with us still. And um, how do our panelists feel? You, you've done such an amazing job. Um, obviously, we could probably talk for another few minutes. How do you feel yeah. about that? Should we cut I think it off? We could, yeah, I think we could quickly. The, the, these okay. next, yeah, I think we could get through real quick. Perfect. Um, yeah. So... The question about potentially putting the equipment or the transformers in the spots. So if if the electric vehicle charging uh, EV spot is basically two parking spots is what one is being considered. If in some scenarios they potentially have to use equipment, I would think that would be something that you can't prohibit them from, from doing. And again, in theory, uh, they're basically telling us when we look at the existing um, an existing site, that we're really not supposed to be doing the calculations, but obviously we're going to be more than aware. And as we're gonna to have to review it for prior conditions and things like that. But I think they are trying to build in that flexibility to be able to do that. So um, I'm gonna move on to the next one, unless my colleagues have anything to add to that. 
Okay, we get site plans. Hello, Jennifer. We get site plans for building additions, which trigger parking calculations. Are these type of applications required to do electric vehicles? Is there a minimum increase? Unless one of my colleagues wants to answer this, I mean, we're still trying to figure out exactly what this might cover. Um, I don't have an exact answer for that. I mean, the language is a little bit general of basically saying is like anything that could be involving a parking or a garage. Well, well what does that mean? <laughs> you know, it's just like putting in an addition usually means you're impacting the parking lot, which usually you have to add more parking spaces. I don't know if the state truly means it like an application coming in and for adding parking spaces, or do they mean like as soon as they go for site plan review, it automatically kicks in a requirement to put in the spots. I've read this ordinance a million times to the point of my eyes bleeding, and I don't know the exact answer, and I don't want to give you the wrong answer. So we're going to find anything that we don't think we understand, we're going to be asking and talking to DCA as well. Are there ADA parking space requirements? Yes. So they're specifically Gosh. outlined in the new, and there is a section that will touch upon that. I don't know if any of my colleagues had more information. Was this for the ADA? For the ADA. So we have it in the one table, uh, we have it laid out. Um, the only thing I can't remember off the top of my head is um, ADA requirements for existing, oh, for doing an existing site and adding parking spaces. Right. I know EDA is addressed uh, in the ordinance and it defers you to UCC code on those. Okay, got it. And then um, our last question, for new multifamily applications that include commercial parking spaces as well, does the 15% rule apply to all spaces or just the residential? Well, um, well that, so that's a really fantastic question. And I don't think we have the answer unless Cliff, you wanted to try to answer that one. I I, I do not. I mean, I, I would think, I would think that, uh, I would think that it, at this point, I think it applies to all the spaces. But I, I again, we do not have a lot of guidance on that. It, now, for some of you who who might have parking regulations that are not always specifically tied to a specific use, but it's more of a hybrid, like. Long, long time ago, it's kind of how they originally came up with the parking requirements, where you're taking elements of a particular building. So you might have a retail section of your building and the warehouse and other things that are done. You put all of that together and you come up with the calculations. Uh, modern times, to some degree, we've gotten a little bit lazy and we go, okay, if it's this use, it's this many, da, 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 da. Well, it might be possible that through this, you would look at it and go, well, how much space, how many parking spaces are on the hook for the residential? And then how many spaces are also for everything else? And then is it really how much that's tied to what's required for your development? Or if you, you happen to go over the limit and you happen to be proposing a certain number of parking spaces, I get the impression that it's really going for the overall site. So if you're proposing whatever amount of parking spaces you're proposing for the site, I'm guessing that's what you would fall into that, into that table. But again, that's something we could call, uh, talk to DCA about. Right. right. Everyone. That I mean, sounds great. 57 people here. So this is incredible. <laughs> it is. It is. Your presentations were incredible. And um, for all the, the questions that you may be fielding directly and any that are sent to us at RideWise, um, maybe we will, the panelists and Sarah, Catherine and I will, uh, will get together and we'll kind of, um, we might put together a resource or maybe you'll direct us to something. And, and with our uh, follow-up email, hopefully next week when we send out the recording, um, if, if not then, you know, at some point over the next um, month or so, we will get out additional follow-up information. And, and one of the last I wanted to say, and again, I want to say and extend to um, you, Leanne, and Sarah Catherine, and the whole RideWise team, uh, thank you for um, working with us in this. This was a really great opportunity. I can't emphasize enough to everyone, um, even though a lot of you are not in Somerset County, please take advantage and go to RideWise's uh, website. They have incredible information on there, 
some really great resources for EVs and, and a number of other things that they also work on. And I guess one of the last things I wanted to say is, um, again, sometimes we might only think of ourselves as, as regulators, but to some degree, feel free to jump into this and really think of yourself as potentially a little bit of an advocate uh, for this, meaning the more educated that you get on this as you speak to different people that are wanting to come in and do things, you could talk to them through the process, you know, educate them, let them know about this, um, rather than them potentially submitting an application without really being being aware of it. If Very you have good to say that, yes. a list resources on your website, potentially linking it to like say a RideWise or maybe some stuff that we might put up, you know, uh, make it as easy as possible for people to find information on this. Make it easier for you you know, that you don't have to tell everyone this, you know, just put it on. If we're in the digital age. Most people don't really want to come in person or talk to you on the phone. They're going to check out your website. They're going to want to find this information. So the more that you can, and even if you're not fully ready, meaning you don't have uh, your zoning permit applications up to date or, or able to handle this, put something out, post something, you know, post something that says, please contact us directly you know, we're aware of this law, we're bringing this law to your attention, you know, reach out to us and we're happy to talk to you with it. Just come across as, you know, as friendly as you possibly can, because in our experience, the more you do that, the more that you're working with people, we really believe that the easier your life will be in doing this. That's, that's a great point. And um, I also want to say that if you, if you are making progress, if you have a challenge or something, you know, let us know. A lot of times people put these, they implement these things and they're doing the work and making progress and we don't know about it. So please let us know, let NJAPZA know what you're doing, let RideWise know. And so um, what you're doing can be used to help others and help us all reach our goals. Um, and we, we thank everyone for being part of this very collaborative effort to increase EV adoption and infrastructure in Somerset County and beyond and everywhere. And, um, you know, to David's point, we are all, um, we have had a lot of experts, our panelists are experts in this area, but myself, not an expert in these areas. And, uh, you know, but we consider ourselves, um, all, we're EV advocates and that's all we need to be. We're enthusiastic about this work. Everybody has a role to play. And we, you know, try to support each other with this coalition and this group. So we hope to see people um, continue with us, even if you're um, uh, just a zoning administrator, or planning official, and you specifically, um, this, this webinar resonated with you. Um, we vary our topics, so not every program will interest you, but we hope to uh, see you again um, at our other programs. And um, I think I'm just going to just officially thank all of our panelists one more time. And if anyone, Christina, David, Cliff, or Sarah Catherine has anything else to say, I can end, we can end the webinar shortly. Yeah, just um, last thing for me, yeah, I hope this served as a really nice primer. Uh, this shouldn't substitute everyone going into the ordinance and reading it. And, and please do that, be critical of it. Um, but, but please, I, I hope that this made it a little bit easier for you to, to navigate through it.